Hello again. It's time for a very special vlog. It's a bit late, I know, but that was because I was waiting for something very special. I promised not terribly long ago that if Tantalus Depths received 500 pre-orders by July 16th, that I would do this thing where I would release the first chapter onto Inkshares so that people can read it, and that I would do a video of me reading the first chapter. And we hit that goal. And in fact, we went significantly farther than that goal. As of right now, today, I, I want to give a little call out to one of my favorite syndicates on Inkshares, the one I'm a member of, the Break the Bechdel Syndicate, which supports strong female characters. They chose Tantalus Steps as this month's project to back. So thanks to their assistance, Tantalus Steps is now sitting currently at 536 pre-orders, which is so much farther ahead of schedule than I had any reasonable expectation of getting. So we're doing great. Keep it up. Keep the pre-orders coming in. I'm super thrilled to be at this stage in the game, at this stage in the game. So I am definitely ready to fulfill my end of the deal and do my reading of chapter one of Tantalus Depths. So not going to be very thought process heavy of a vlog this week just because I'm doing the the reading of the chapter instead of personal commentary but hopefully it's something people will like so without further ado Tantalus Depths Chapter 1 27 light years from Earth more than 170 trillion miles and Mary Ketch still couldn't find a moment's peace. Rook, Yancey, keep it down back there, would you? She called from her acceleration couch in the day Amelin's cockpit. Decelerating this flying lunchbox is hard enough without you two distracting me. Hollis Rook floated from the main habitation module with a bottle of champagne in his hand and a foolish-looking party hat strapped to his equally foolish-looking head. Mary, babe, live a little, would you? Six months on this can are finally about to pay off. It's time for some fun. It won't be a payoff if I can't get us there, so you'd be way better off letting me do my job. Just keep it down. I Skipper. Rook gave her an irritating salute and retreated back into the hab mod. And if you're going to open that bottle, do it in the shower. I don't want sticky walls in my ship, she called back. Yes, Mom, Rook replied. Mary winced at that one, though she knew Rook didn't know any better. He was a jerk, and he was in rare form with his jerkishness today, but he wasn't cruel. She'd never told any of her six crewmates about her real reason for embarking on this 13-month round-trip expedition to Tantalus 13. It was far too personal to be any of their business. Besides, Becky Travis was the only other female member of the crew, and Mary had never exactly bonded with her. Mary knew none of her fellows would really be able to understand what she was going through. Besides, bringing the matter up with one of them would have largely defeated her purpose for taking this job to begin with. Getting away from her home problems had been the main reason she'd taken the pilot job for the deep space surveyor ship Diamelin on its mission to set up a mining colony on Tantalus 13. A year seemed more than enough time to figure herself out, sort out her issues, and decide on a new plan for her future. However, there was less than a day's journey left to the planet, and Mary didn't feel like she'd found any answers at all. Mary flipped on the intercom. Attention, crew, I'm about to turn off the superluminals, so I strongly suggest buckling in somewhere. She figured they probably wouldn't listen, but the deceleration turbulence wouldn't kill them, so she didn't care too much what they did. She waited about a minute and activated the superluminal drive's shutdown sequence. The diamelin rumbled and rattled as the null mass bubble encasing the ship was flooded with pseudo-particulate matter, rapidly decelerating the ship to sublight speeds like a drag chute behind a race car. As the ship continued to slow to about 60% of the speed of light, the turbulence grew less and less severe until the speed hung at a constant 40%. We're at sublight cruising speed, gentlemen. Estimated time till next deceleration is four hours, six hours to planetary orbit. She took off her headset and hung it on its magnetic docking pad, then unbuckled herself from the acceleration couch. 
She climbed around it and pushed herself gracefully back through the cockpit bulkhead and floated down the access corridor to the habitation module. As she floated through the doorway, a gush of foamy champagne struck her in the face with enough force to send her into a backflip. Rook, she bellowed angrily as she steadied herself against a handrail. Rook was laughing hysterically, joined by Yancey, Becky, and Hertz. Mary brushed the gob of champagne foam from her face and glowered at the four through a debris field of champagne bubbles and droplets. Rook and Yancey were idiots, and she expected them to act like it, but Becky and Hertz knew better. She was their geologist, and he was an electronics engineer. They both had doctorates, for crying out loud. Rook and Yancey were just miners, grunts. By all accounts, they were good at what they did, but professionalism wasn't really a factor they felt the need to respect. Sorry, Mare, Becky said between laughs. It was too hard to resist. I'll just bet, Mary said, glaring at Rook, who she instinctively knew was the originator of the idea. If I find anything sticky in here later, all four of you are going to lick it clean. Got it? No worries there, Skipper, Yancey said smugly. We're not about to waste a drop of it. He opened his mouth like a hungry carp and slurped down a plum-sized gob of floating fluid. Yancey! Rook! The five occupants of the hab mod turned to the back bulkhead to see Commander Drake Gorister with a disapproving frown. What is this? Why would you just assume one of us did it? Rook asked obstinately. Experience. You know the protocols for airborne fluids? There shouldn't be any. Where'd you even get that bottle? Come on, Commander, we're almost at Tantalus. What's wrong with a little celebration? pleaded Yancey. Nothing at all. Airborne fluids getting into the shipboard electronics. There's plenty wrong with that. Clean this up now. Yancey started to slurp up another gobule of liquid when Gorister's clipboard hit him in the side of his head. Use a vacuum, the commander ordered. Sure thing, boss, said Yancey without much enthusiasm. Gorister turned to Becky and Hertz. You two help them. The two knew better than to protest against Gorister's orders, and they begrudgingly went to the cleaning supplies. Gorister looked at Mary's soaked shirt. You weren't involved with this, were you, Mary? Not willingly, no, sir. Figured not. Go ahead and get cleaned up. Thank you, sir. Mary floated past the snickering Rook and Yancey into the sleeping module, grabbed a new shirt from her locker, and made her way to the shower. As she did so, she thought, not for the first time on this journey, that she probably should have just stayed home. Mary emerged from the cramped lavatory seven minutes later, though the shower itself had only lasted two. She couldn't wait to get back to Earth and take a good long shower, one where the facilities were larger than a coffin. It'd be nice also to have water warmer than room temperature that came from an actual faucet rather than a dozen sprinkler heads on every wall. It would also be really, really nice to be able to use water that had not been previously drunk, urinated, filtered, processed, and then drunk again about 30 more times. These kinds of inconveniences were the reason she'd limited herself to short intrasystem shuttle flights before. Get in ship, fly ship from planet to moon, fly ship back. Ten hours tops. But your bladder can't hold out for a year-long round-trip flight, and you do need water, and there's only so much water you can take with you, so drinking and bathing and recycled pee became a fact you just had to accept. Mary floated back into the sleep mod and put her dirty clothes into the hamper where they would stay until it was time to wash them with the same lovely repurposed urine water they used for everything else. She grabbed a brush from her locker and began working over the still wet hair that was becoming increasingly difficult to manage. She'd started the flight with a very short, practical pixie cut. Long hair in zero gravity was problematic for obvious reasons, and she'd meant to keep it short for the whole journey. However, as the voyage continued and she found herself constantly reminded of the overabundance of Y chromosomes on the ship, particularly the smothering testosterone levels Rook and Yancey insisted on displaying, she began to feel the need to exert her own femininity or else become one of them. So she grew her hair out. Practicality be hanged. Satisfied that she no longer looked like the Bride of Frankenstein, Mary put the brush away and tucked her hair into a neat ponytail with a rubber band. It was only as she did this that she realized one of the bunks at the sleep mod was occupied. 
Ramanath and Bakal, their medical officer, lay strapped down in his bunk. He wasn't sleeping, he was simply lying there with his hands clasped together over his stomach, staring at the bunk above him. Hey, Nate, Mary said warmly. You ready for Tantalus? We'll be landing in a bit. Ramanathan nodded imperceptibly, not making eye contact. Yes, I'll be ready. My things are packed. Mary hoped to strike up a conversation. You excited? Six months of waiting and we're about to hit the payoff. Sure, said Ramanathan, still not looking at her. Mary smiled tightly. Well, better get back to the cockpit. See you, Nate. See you. She didn't have to get to the cockpit. She still had almost four hours before she would have anything to do other than going over checklists, but she knew better than to try and communicate with Ramanathan when he was in one of these moods. Every member of the crew had been put through strict psychiatric mental health evaluation before being cleared for the mission. Long-term space flights brought with them endless sources of stress. It was also a breeding ground for phobias. In fact, it was probably the only place you could be claustrophobic and agoraphobic at the same time cramped up in a metal box no bigger than a couple of subway cars for six months at a time, yet surrounded by infinite airless void on all sides. They could easily drive an unstable mind to the breaking point. All seven of the Diamelin's crewmen had passed this rigorous psych screening, though Mary did have some red marks left by her own name. Phrases like postpartum depression and even PTSD almost cost her the job but she was cleared on the basis that these particular conditions would likely not be compounded by space travel, and she was otherwise in good mental health. Ramanathan, on the other hand, he had passed the evaluations just fine, and at first he seemed like space travel suited him well. Mary liked him more than most of the other crewmen, largely because he minded his own business and acted like a professional. But a few months into the journey, it became clear that he was not cut out for long-term space travel at all. He became quieter and more withdrawn, sometimes going for days without speaking a word to anyone or even leaving his bunk. He carried out his shipboard duties, but didn't socialize with the crew unless he had to. Mary felt for the man, but she couldn't think of anything to do for him. It wasn't as if they could just turn around and take him home. They were locked into this course, well past the point of no return. She hoped he could hold it together for the rest of the trip, but they had six more months to go once they finished on Tantalus 13. She could only hope that setting foot on solid ground, even if it wasn't Earth, might do him some good. She pushed herself through the doorway and drifted back into the hab mod, which Yancey and Rook were still cleaning. She flew straight on through to the cockpit, where she settled into her acceleration couch and prepped herself for busy work. It was going to be a long six hours. And that is the end of chapter one of Tantalus 13. Chapter three is already up on Ink Shares if you want to skip ahead and read it. Otherwise, um, I intend to release chapter two once I reach 600 pre orders. So keep your eyes open for that. Do whatever you possibly can to get us there as soon as possible because I enjoyed doing this and hope you did too. Uh, otherwise, I will see you on the flip side.